It's season two, episode eight of the Hall of Fame show. The buck stops here and the buck is here with, of course, Evan Nolan. Say hi, Evan. Hi, Evan. <laughs> sorry, that was a little lame. I'm sorry. I was wondering if you were going to do that. I, I wanted to toss out that softball and just see if you were going to go full uh, George and Gracie on me. Take my wife, please. I take her everywhere, but she finds her way back. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> This is in case we've got a high over 90 population listening to us. I don't think that we do, but you never know. Uh, hey, H- Henny Youngman still got a fan club somewhere. I'm sure, I'm sure he does. <laughs> King of the one-liners. So we mm-hmm. got uh, actually a little bit more than last week. We've got a significant retirement in the NFL to look at. Two mm-hmm. uh, baseball Hall of Fames have announced, so this is Franchise Hall of Fames, they've got their finalists, and one we're pretty excited to talk about, and one not so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a few... Yeah, and, and, and it does hurt a little bit, because the one that I'm excited to talk about, I mean, they do a good job with the Hall of Fame, but the fans are just so smug. Yeah, I guess you're getting a bigger taste of that now living in Chicago than you did when you were in Boston, huh? Yeah, but we played them in the two World Series in 04 and 07, and their fans just were trying to tell us how they invented baseball. Oh, I, I had so. no idea it came from uh, the city of St. Louis. Look what I learned. Oh, yeah, St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Louis Cardinals fans are pretty annoying. But anyway, continue. Yes, yeah, so we've got that. We have our usual uh, death, uh, death march, but we've with a pretty significant name that we definitely have to look at. Uh, another one from my youth that I think is pretty significant. And uh, as usual, Evan always tells us if the beige mistress is struck. Uh, sort of? Sort we'll of. We'll talk about Ooh. that when we get there. Okay, interesting. <laughs> interesting. So I guess we'll get right to it with uh, the two halls of fame, huh? St. Louis. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good place to start. Yeah, uh Oh, or do you want to start? Or do you want to start off, or always hammer off with uh, your your uh, anti sportsman of the week? No, no, we'll save that for the end. Let's let's start with the Cardinals and Royals. All right, so yes, Missouri. yeah. So the Cardinals and the Royals, as you can have guessed, is the one we're just like sh- kind of shaking our heads at when we get to the nominees. Uh, it's almost so underwhelming. You probably didn't even know they had much of a Hall of Fame, but they actually did. They put theirs out uh, 28 years before the Cardinals, which is so strange. Wow. But the Cardinals have done it so well. I don't think I've ever seen anything make up for lost time like the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame. I love their Hall of Fame. Yeah, their Hall of Fame is pretty good. I know the Patriots... The Patriots Hall of Fame is also really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I know another group of fans that I am a member of, but a lot of people don't like. Uh, but theirs was around for a long time without really being cool, and now it's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's good to see what the Cardinals have done. I agree with that. They may do a good job with it. Yeah, and so their nominees are always interesting. Oh, I, I have a – I already I'll, I think you'll probably have a pretty good guess who I picked. But let's just uh, give everyone the five nominees. And you can actually vote on this because the winner of this will get in and will be the the sole inductee for the class of 2021. Uh, They're all going to be nominated – or sorry, nominated – inducted with class of 2020 who, uh, needless to say, Mm -hmm. were not able to have a ceremony due to COVID-19. Those three – Yeah, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it's uh, former second baseman Tom Herr. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. right. I never knew if it was Herr or Herr. I think it's Tommy Herr. I think so, yeah. Uh, John Tudor, another good pitcher, and someone who we talked a lot about last year, uh, Bill White. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good class. And it was, it was a little surprising with that class because uh, I think most of these five who they have listed who are all really good candidates mm-hmm. won about last year. None of them got in. If I may be mistaken, I'm not sure. Was Renteria there? Renteria is the only one I wasn't sure if it was there. I'm uh, not positive, but I know for sure Carlton, uh, Hernandez, Morris, and Smith were. But probably, yeah. probably. But yeah, so those are the five. So I guess we can start off uh, one uh, just alphabetically. Uh, Steve Carlton, who is nominated again, a uh, current member of the Baseball Hall of Fame, having been inducted in 1994. That's where he started. Uh it's so weird to sort of imagine that he was not the ace of that team when it's Steve Flip and Carlton. Yeah. 
but he you know, wasn't. They had, they had a pretty good pitcher there uh, at the same time. As I said, probably my first draft pick, if you could give me the mm-hmm. entire history of all players in the league, mm-hmm. uh, the late Bob Gibson. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Carlton's uh, got he's got a decent resume three all star three all star games as a, as a Redbird a twenty game winner when I think that mattered a little bit more or that's when we thought it mattered more I think that might be more accurate. Although I'd have to say if you won twenty games now even if with everything else you'd probably just win the Cy Young. Pa- probably. I mean, it, it's, it's such I, a different I, mindset. I, I, now. I don't think wins matter unless you get to twenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I because so few people get there or pitch enough. Oh my god! Uh, I, I honestly think they should change it so that you have, that uh, the win rule to the four innings instead of five. Mm. Well, I mean that that one makes some sense, uh, but that's not even half a game. So <laughs> it, it looks strange. It, it, but, then, but but then again, relievers get wins when they pitch a third of an inning. So that's true. That's true. And they can, let, and, a, and a reliever can let in uh, three runs or sorry, two, two runs and one and one third of an inning and still get a save, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Keith Hernandez, first baseman, former MVP, mm-hmm. world series winner and fringe hot baseball hall of famer. Someone who I think, Mm-hmm. think was on the ballot for the full 15 years, or if not, at least more than a few. I could be wrong in the 15 years, but I know he did receive some consideration, and it wouldn't surprise anyone if he popped on a Veterans Committee ballot one day. Agreed. I'll, 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 ch- I'll check how many times on the ballot here. Hold on. Keith Hernandez, because I have a spreadsheet for everything. <laughs> uh, hold on. Uh, I'm in the wrong place. There we go. Fine, next. So... 2000 and he was on a ballot and he fell off a ballot in 2004 on his ninth attempt. Ninth, okay. All right. So it's half right. Uh, Matt Morris, pretty good pitcher in his day. 101 wins uh, for St. Louis, two time all-star, just not three, uh, just 14 uh, strikeouts shy of the 1000 mark and uh, did lead the, lead the national league in wins. In 2001, right. uh, Renteria, Edgar Renteria, uh, shortstop. Imagine that you're a shortstop, uh, playing for, for St. Louis. And then you're not even probably the most known shortstop ever. And you're still Edgar Renteria. who's damn good. And Edgar Renteria, one of the three moving parts of the, uh, Nomar trade. That oh. brought Ed, Ed, uh, Cabrera to, uh, Boston back in 2004. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was, uh, and then he ended up in Boston in 2005, and it didn't go so well. But Renteria was a very good player. Particularly, he was great with the Marlins, uh, and great with the Cardinals, and okay in Boston. And then he was he was good for a long time. So, yeah, so I think he won a, a World Series before and after, but mm-hmm. not with St. Louis. Correct. Yeah. And he had, the, he had the big hit against the uh, Indians in the 97 World Series. It's a World Series I keep forgetting about completely. And it's so easy because that team just blew up so fast. Yeah. And yeah one, of the, one of the greatest teams just completely get blown up out of nowhere for no really good reason. Other than in fact, the owner was, the owner was just rich and didn't feel like spending money. So... And they did it twice. Did it twice. Yep. I, I honestly don't know why anyone, unless you're living right in Miami and you're just obsessed with baseball and you're a younger fan, I don't know why anyone would say, you know what, I don't think I want to be a Marlins fan. Yeah, the Marlins are the Eli Manning of baseball. They made the playoffs twice and won it both times. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eli made it more than that, but he only won playoff games in two seasons, and he went, went to the World Series and won it, beat the Patriots both times. So, okay, if, if you're going to win, if you're going to win twice, you might as well beat the Patriots. I disagree, but go ahead. I, well, <laughs> in, okay, taking away the Patriots fandom out of it, it's agreed. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. I just had to. I had to stand up there somehow. Uh, go ahead. All good. I got gotcha. you. And Lee Smith, uh, so two Baseball Hall of Famers who were on this, only there for three and a half years, but 
those were three and a half really good years. Three All-Stars, runner-up for the Cy Young in 1991. Yeah, they were really big on relievers in like 89 to 91 in the All-Star, in the, in the Cy Young voting. Mm-hmm. So, well, and I, yeah, no, another, another great player. And probably, what team do you think of Lee Smith with the most? I mean, he picked for the Red Sox, but I still think of him as Cardinal. Uh, by default, as a Cub, because that's the one baseball card I still have of his. Ah, interesting. But, you know. What actually? I don't even know this answer. What did he go in as? It's a good question. I don't even know that answer. What team did Lee Smith? This is good content right here. <laughs> um, he went in with the Cubs. Went in with the Cubs. All right. So look at that. I knew that the entire time. I just wanted to see if you knew that. Uh, I I did because Google told me. Ah, nice. uh, but you know, he, he was with the Cubs from eighty to eighty seven. I guess that makes the most sense. Red Sox eighty eight to ninety, Cardinals ninety ninety three, Yankees in ninety three, Orioles ninety four, Angels ninety five ninety six, Reds ninety six, Expos ninety seven. So, yeah, I, wonder, I wonder why he didn't pick that Expo. I thought, I thought it was Expo. I thought it was Expo sixty seven. That means I'm wrong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Very good. So anyway, I voted for Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez, which is the same person I voted for the last two years. Yeah, that's a pretty good vote. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with really any of these guys, but I think Hernandez is for just the longevity with the team. The fact he won an MVP, um, I just think he he's the the right person from this team. I, I I mean. He's the person probably most associated with this team. Although Matt Morris is associated with this team, but Keith Hernandez was a better player than Matt Morris. So The only thing I can think of, and I guess this is where I need a Cardinal fan to really explain this to me, why aren't you voting for this guy? Oh, I haven't actually... I tried, every time I try and vote, it says that there's an error, so I don't know uh, how, the, how the vote is going. Hmm. How, how is the vote going? I honestly don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, so you haven't voted. You're just saying, why is he still out here? To no, vote? no, no. Yeah, I, no, I already voted. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. But I did that a few days ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it doesn't let me vote. Oh. When I try. So. I, I must have heard what you said. About who? <laughs> about the whole, about the Cardinals. <laughs> now, now, now it's voting. Now it's letting me vote. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to vote for, uh, I'll vote for Hernandez right now. And... I have to give them my information. I'll give the Cardinals my information. Well, I just usually <laughs> I, 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 consider the Cardinals. Um, you know all the, the the Cardinals advanced scouts listen to this. Uh, I would definitely say I, I'd count my vote for Keith Hernandez. So there you go. Every time I've got to give information, I always give it to somebody who I used to work with that I really don't like. <laughs> who I'm pretty sure is not actually listening to this show. So I'm really not that concerned. But anyway, I think we agree that Hernandez should be the first. But I do, but the Cardinals... I'm not going to be upset if any of them get it. But the Cardinals but fans don't seem to. Person. What are we missing? Why have they passed over Keith Hernandez for John Tudor? And no disrespect to John Tudor, but... Huh? They really just, they really just like his Just for Men commercials. You know, he didn't ask to be traded out. Herzog sort of forced that. And now, gr- granted, that was... a. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, Hernandez's uh, affinity for a certain white substance. Mm. Nevertheless, he wasn't the only one doing that, and perhaps Hernandez was a bit of a whiner behind the scenes. Don't know. I'm assuming Whitey thinks thought so. But Whitey, who was asked about this last year, says, I don't know why he's not in. I think he should. Yeah, I don't know. So, anyway, Cardinals fans, vote for Keith Hernandez. Get him in there. So, And again, Cardinals fans, uh, despite what Evan says, I love you. I think you guys are all right. I got no problem with you. Yeah, I, I, I just I had those two World Series, and now I live in Cubs country. So take out anything I say on the grain of salt. <laughs> the one thing that comes to Red Sox fans agree on is that Cardinals fans are annoying. And the one thing that, uh, Red, uh, that Bruins and 
and Blackhawks fans is Rihanna Zep, the Canucks fans are just I don't know what what to say about them. They're just they are the worst. They're the worst fans in sports. Canucks the, fans. the Canucks fans are well, they're they're pretty awful. I, I got to introduce you to some Leaf fans. Yeah, but the Leafs have never really mattered during my lifetime here in the United States. So now, now that they're doing well, I, I think it's funny they got the Leafs out of the division with the Lightning and the Bruins, and now they're like taking off. Yeah, so. well, the playoffs still come, I, and I'll still maintain that that is the that is the wimpiest uh, team name in sports. The Maple Leafs. It's Leaf. It's a Leaf. What's it going to do? Clog, like clog up your lawnmower. I mean, I have to think, is there a worse one than the Maple Leafs? Well, I mean, like, as a, as a little kid, no disrespect, but I always thought the Red Sox and White Sox, it's an article of clothing. Well, I have to say, if the Red Sox or the White Sox, if one of those didn't exist, wouldn't the other team name just seem weird? That's very true. Like, it, 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 it's not S-O-C-K-S, it's just S-O-X. I just feel like, why did they do that? And, but, the, like, the existence of the other team somehow justifies... <laughs> the, the the spelling of SOX. This is very strange. So, well, at least they change it from stockings to socks. True. I'll, I'll say Although that. They should, go, they, they, they should go back to the Pilgrims, really. So, for the <laughs> for the for the uh, Red Sox, anyway. So, um, yeah. So, do you want to talk about the Royals? Ugh. Talk about. Talk about things that are weird. Okay. Uh, have, no, I don't so want to talk about them, but I'm going to. <laughs> no, so explain their process, which is different from the Cardinals process. Okay. So again, you can vote for that for it, but your vote's not going to make not really going to matter. I mean, it will. Apparently, it counts as towards three votes towards the total. Now, who else can vote? All living members of the Royals Hall of Fame. Select members of the Royal Front Office staff, whoever that might be. Royals Associates with 15 years or more service. Select members of the Kansas City Chapter of the Baseball Writers of America. And select Kansas City Electronic Media members. And much like the actual Baseball Hall of Fame, you've got to get 75%. So there may not actually be an inductee. There probably won't be. Cause I, well, I, do they only get to vote for one, or do they get to vote for, like, three? Because I know the fans get to vote for one. It doesn't say. Hmm. It doesn't say. I mean, I mean there might be some yeah, blank if, ballots here. Okay, yeah, because if you only get to vote for one, then it's nobody's going to get 75%. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Uh, but here are the people they have. And I did vote for I, – I did – I don't know why I bothered, but I did uh, – Carlos Beltran, and that's the person who I voted for, and get him doing this alphabetically. So it was the, uh-huh. was the rookie of the year there, but like uh-huh. a lot of Royals in certain time periods, it's a small market team, so their windows are always going to be pretty short. Uh-huh. So his best years were long gone, and there might be some people who might, not, who might just say, I'm not voting for the guy because he cheated. I did not vote for him, so there. Okay. I voted, but not for Baltron. Okay. Uh, so then we have uh, Billy Butler, former DH and first baseman. Mm-hmm. Proof, proof that anybody Ted can play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Was an all-star once. A uh, eh, terrible fielder, but hence, thank God for him, the designated hitter role existed. But he's Sorry, can, can I can I just say that their own website says that Billy Butler, who played for the team from 2007 to 2014, mm-hmm. was a first round pick in 2014 and had his best season in 2012. It says he's he was a first dr- round pick in the seventh year of the season and had his best. It says, come on, he was a first round pick and in 2014, but it said he was a first round pick in 2014. Wow, which is not true. So. All right. Not that's that's pretty bad. No, granted, I've had some pretty bad typos on my sites before. I will again. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah that's <laughs> that's fascinating. And here we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here. No disrespect, but okay, or maybe it is disrespect. Kyle Davies, two thousand seven to two thousand eleven, record of twenty nine and forty four, and an ERA of five point three four. 
hey, he had 2.4 career hit war with the team. So come on. <sighs> He won. He won nine nine wins in two thousand eight, and won eight wins in two thousand nine and two thousand and ten. And then was released in two thousand eleven. His ERA of five point three four is the highest in club history for anyone with at least five hundred innings pitched. Get excited, Kansas City! <laughs> <laughs> this could be your next Hall of Famer. <sighs> yeah. Uh, Johnny Damon, outfielder, uh, very much like Beltron, had his best years elsewhere. Is that who you voted for? Yeah, of course it is. Okay. Yep. Jo- Johnny Damon, or as after he went to the Yankees, the t-shirt in Boston said, looks like Jesus, acts like Judas, throws like Mary. Johnny Damon. Didn't, and, uh, not as pretty as I remember him. His latest DUI uh, mugshot wasn't quite the same model that I remember. Yeah, he um, he married a, like a real housewife, or his wife became a real housewife, and then I don't know. He's he's got some issues at the moment. He also is the most likely uh, most likely player in baseball history to be able to stand in as one of the Geico cavemen without makeup. <laughs> nice. Uh, and let's. Uh, and then it kind of goes back to down here. Jeremy Guthrie, another pitcher, four point three eight ERA. There's that, but he was on the World Series winning team in 2015. Didn't do shit, but he was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, apologies if I'm saying his name wrong because I know I don't remember this guy at all. Uh, Luke Hochevar. Hochevar. Luke Hochaver. 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 Okay. Yeah, you remember Luke Hochaver? No, I don't remember him at all. Yeah, he was the number one pick in the draft. No, oh, was it the same year he retired? It was not in this case. It was, he was drafted pick in 2006. He started in 2007, so. I mean, at least another guy who was on that 2015 winning team but didn't do much there. He had already lost, he would already been kicked out of the starting rotation long by then. But well, he, well, he had Tommy John surgery. He was coming back, so... He wasn't going to be ready for the whole rotation. So. Didn't, didn't, when he came back, though, I don't think he was ever, ever even. I don't think he ever started again. Uh, that I can't tell you, but it does say here that he didn't allow any runs in the postseason in 2015 when they won the championship. So he he would pitch ten and two thirds innings in the postseason without allowing a run, which that, that, that is good. In high leverage situations is pretty good. That is good. And Jordano Ventura, who could have been something, but he died. Yeah, he also is leading the fan vote right now. Which I, I could actually see that. Because he was pretty good. Could have been on the cusp of, I don't know, maybe a career where he could have won 150 games on the, on the high end. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, so, he, so he's leading the fan vote. And then Carlos Beltran... And then Billy Butler, and then as I used to say in the opening version of uh, Gilligan's Island, and the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so Ventura's at 34%, Beltran's 32 Butler's 26 And then four for Damon, two for Hoshever, uh, one for Davies, and one for Guthrie. Guthrie has got 12 votes, Davies has seven. So at least there's still seven people who either are ironically voting for Kyle Davies or Kyle Davies' his parents, siblings, and wife are voting for him. So I don't even think Kyle Davies could type in his own name because it would go outside the box. Ooh, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, that, that has to be, honestly, like, I can't remember a worse candidate in any Hall of Fame for anything ever than Kyle Davies. I'm sure there is one, but I... Don't I don't have the time to scour the internet for it? Yeah, I don't know. I know. I know. We did once. Uh, was it even on when we had this podcast, or was it pre this podcast? We did the worst retired numbers in sports. Yeah. Was that last season, or was that because we did podcasts before we officially had this one? Yeah, I can't remember. But and then we did some of those podcasts, some of those numbers retired, not counting people like Malik Seely or oh, there, uh, there's some Skip garbage who died in accidents or something like that. 
but some of them there were pretty bad. I just, I can't imagine anyone worse than like, he's legitimately the worst for ERA for the team in team history. And the Royals have been around for a while uh, with, with anyone who's like had a significant time with the team. Why is he here? I don't know. I mean, like the only thing I can think of is they're just going to put anyone here who qualifies by their metric. Cause it also says if it doesn't, if they don't get at least 10%, they're off the ballot. Mm-hmm. So I suppose he's not going to make 10%. I would think. Yeah. I can't imagine. I, I, again, who, who would really vote for them? I, I have no idea. So I do have to say that I enjoy the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the roundup for this team is the Royals rumblings. I thought you'd appreciate that. I do. <laughs> I do. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you guys should elect Beltron. I vote for Johnny Damon just because, uh, but you should vote, you should vote for Beltron or I guess Ventura would be fine as well. Um, and, and see who gets in. Beltron should be the person they put in though, if anybody. And if not, if no one gets in, I won't care. Yeah, no. So. All right. So speaking of a dead topic, let's go to dead people. Oh, there we go. That's, hey, you're getting good at this. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, as I said, the Beige Mistress sort of did it. So we didn't lose any athletes or singers, but we did lose a member of the Supreme Court of Hungary. Oh. They lo- lost their former Minister of Agriculture. Uh, we lost Eva Ozlovsky, a Hungarian actress. But most importantly, we lost Vilmos Bensik who is one of the foremost uh, translator between Hungarian and Esperanto. What the hell is Esperanto? That sounds like something I'd get on an espresso. <laughs> it does. Esperanto is the made-up language they try to create in order to make, uh, try to come up with world peace. It was created in 1887 by a Polish guy uh, who tried to, com- Esperanto is, essentially one who hopes and he tried to come up with a flexible language that would go like combine most of the other at least European languages together and so it's a completely made up language that there are some speakers of out there there are books and classes you can take in it but there's no one who's ever natively spoken Esperanto um, but I just thought the fact that like the fact they list him on they list him on Wikipedia as an Esperantist. I'm like, what is an Esperantist? And the answer is, it is someone who translates their native language into a made-up language. So it's like a Klingonologist or a Dothrakian or oh, whatever. Jesus Christ. But yeah, so like I said, there were, we had four Hungarians. None of them would be people who we ever know. So that's why she was sort of involved. What, what's, uh, what's nerdier? Going to Esperanto? Esperanto? Esperanto, yes. Esperanto. E-S-P-E-R-A-N-P-O, Esperanto. Sounds like a suburb outside of Toronto. And, yes, probably true. It, it, it may very well be. You never know. Uh, so what, what's, what's worse, do, learning that or learning Klingon? Going to Klingon language camp. Klingon at least has other people you can talk to and movies you can follow. <laughs> <sighs> so... Yeah, I don't know. Hey, man, everyone, everyone's got to have a hobby. Not hurting anybody. But, yeah, Esperanto, as the uh, Vilmos Bensik, who was first elected to the Acad- Academio de Esperanto in 2010, uh, or 2001, and was elected in 2010 and 2019. So, yeah, anyway. It was a noble idea, though. I'll say that. Yeah, he tried. Yeah, all the way back in 1887. But the problem is, again, so when this is going way off the thing, I never thought I would talk about Pope Benedict on this one. I'm going to talk about Pope Benedict. When Pope Benedict took over the Catholic Church, he decided that the English versions of things weren't correct, even though he doesn't speak English natively. So he got someone else to translate the original Latin stuff into English. But instead of hiring an English-speaking person to do it, he hired a dude from Brazil 
And for that reason, all the prayers I grew up with now have like ridiculous things in them you would never say in English. It's sort of the same thing with Esperanto. Esperanto, they took a guy who is Polish. So he speaks a language which is unintelligible to anyone who speaks Roman Romance languages, essentially. Like all the Z's and C's and everything. And tried to combine the Romance languages with Greek and German and like Russian into one thing. And it just, it was noble attempt, but it, he was in over his head. So, anyway. So we've now talked about Esperanto and Pope Benedict. So you guys scoring at home with topics you never thought we'd get to, feel free to cross them off your list. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're playing the, like, I, at some point they're going to say this on the bingo card, you got it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like the, the, random, the random word death pool that, we, that you were talking about. Just, are they ever going to talk about this? There we go. We got Esperanto and Pope Benedict the 14th, 16th, I remember. I, 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 I stopped yeah. counting after 12. <laughs> and it's not, again, not that it's Pope Benedict's fault, but I just thought it was weird that we went from a pope who was like in a concentration camp as a kid to a pope who was a member of the Hitler Youth. Like, I just feel like there could have been a different way to do that. Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, because John Paul II would spend a lot of time in concentration camp when he was a kid. And to be fair to Benedict, he did try, he ran away from the Hitler Youth like three times. And they kept bringing him back. So he tried leaving, but he did, was not successful. Um, but it was just like a weird thing. He was also what I like to, he was also uh, head of what I like to call a Cheney committee, named after Dick Cheney. Because mm-hmm. Dick Cheney was head of the vice presidential search committee for Bush, uh, George W. Bush, and then came up with himself as the vice president. Uh, Benedict was in charge of the search for the new pope. And the college cardinals, and he got himself elected. So, huh? It's it's like a yeah. lot, it's like when we look at a lot of GMs who name themselves coach. Yes, exactly. After so, an exhaustive search, I can't find anyone who's better than me. <laughs> the I, the autobiography of Jerry Jones. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, who else we got? Um. All right, so do you want, let's start in the world of wrestling. Okay. Um, so the first one was a, a wrestler, four-time winner of the Worldwide Wrestling Federation Junior Heavyweight Championship, John, uh, Johnny DeFazio, mm-hmm. uh, passed away uh, at the age of 80. He was actually uh, active in the Steelworkers of America and was a councilman in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania from 1999 to 2019. It was a fan favorite back when they had all the divisions and divisions in wrestling that would split the country up all crazy like that. He was very popular in the uh, 60s and 70s and wrestled on the, uh, the Pittsburgh station all the time. So one of the early champions of regional wrestling. Um, we also had someone who you have a little bit problem more to say bit. about. Yeah. Jim, Jim Crockett Jr. Mm-hmm. is an uh, American professional wrestling promoter. Um, he was affiliated, his uh, Jim Crockett production is affiliated with the NWA. Um, he also had, owned minor league baseball team, you know, minor league hockey team, and stuff like that. Do you have anything to say about Jim Crockett? Yeah, uh, Crockett, because uh, he owned a, it was a, uh, Carolina Wrestling. So he was based mostly in the Carolinas and then in 85 he bought or he got he got the time slot on TBS and Ted Turner loved pro wrestling Turner was believed that it was because it was always consistent ratings and it didn't cost that much to produce so as much as a lot of his uh, cohorts always looked down on it Ted Turner never did he always appreciated what it was it was good strong programming for him and so Croc- Crockett then sort of like then merged over into the Georgia area and then what was pretty much in the 80s, the closest competition of Vince McMahon in the WWF. So they tried to go national buying out the territories in Oklahoma uh, and in Florida. And for a while there, their wrestling was like really good. I, I, I only learned about, about it then as a kid through the old wrestling magazines and shit like that. And then I would get a few VHS tapes. Save my money for that. 
And that was back when they had like Ric Flair, the Road Warriors, uh, Dusty Rhodes, Lex Luger, the Four Horsemen, the Midnight Express. So like the wrestling there was a lot better. Mm-hmm. So I have some pretty good memories of that uh, of him. Him, he went right at, after Vince a couple times, or actually more Vince really more tried to mess with him. Uh, McMahon told promoters, or sorry, not promoters, uh, the the pay per view companies that if you show Crockett's uh, Starcade, which is their version of WrestleMania, you're not going to get WrestleMania. Mm. Which was pretty interesting that they all sort of fell for it. Like, what are they going to do if they tell Vince, like, okay, well, then fine. We don't want WrestleMania. Where is he going, where was he going to put it there then? Nowhere. He needed the pay-per-view. It was a, no one called his bluff, which is sort of interesting. And then he would deliberately run big shows against Crockett, but then Crockett would do the same thing back. But by 1990, he sold it to Turner, and then he was pretty much mm-hmm. out of it. Yeah. Yeah, he went and became a real estate broker in Texas, actually, eventually. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, he passed away at the age of 76 of liver and kidney failure earlier this week. Um, so we had a couple of people from the jazz world or, uh, or, or band world. So Duffy Jackson, a very well-known uh, American jazz drummer, passed away at the age of... Actually, I don't know what how old he was, but he was he one of the guys just on the jazz circuit. Passed away. Who played with a bunch of people. We also had uh, Ralph uh, Patterson or Peterson Jr., who was a band leader, a jazz band leader, also a drummer. Uh, passed away at the age of only fifty eight uh, from complications of cancer. Um, we had from the international sports world. We had. Uh, Finnish world champion rally driver Hanu Mikulo passed away at the age of 78. Uh, won multiple, uh, uh, won multiple uh, rallies all over the world. A lot of them in England and stuff. But he was he was world champion, so I wanted to make sure we talked about him for a second. Uh, Alexander Klep- Klepikov, who won uh, gold in the Olympics. Uh, in Montreal in 76, uh, where he, with the, uh, uh, in a Russian rower, passed away at the age of 70. Uh, and a member of the Scottish National Football Hall of Fame, Ian St. John, passed away at the age of 82. Uh, one of the greatest players in, uh, in Scottish soccer history. Uh, he died of uh, the long illness, probably related to issues he had with bladder cancer and prostate cancer he'd had years previously. Mm. Um, but that goes through that. Um, for uh, more recent people here, another member, for the second player in like a month, from those two, um, those two Broncos teams who won the championships in 97-98, uh, Darius Johnson passed away at the age of only 48. Um, he was a backup, he was a, a backup uh, cornerback Played on both teams, but still, it's like it's like two of them in three weeks when uh, Tony, uh, the offensive lineman, they make completely forgot. Also passed away very recently. Um, the former general manager of the Montreal Canadiens, Irving Grundman, passed away. He was the uh, general manager uh, for um, the team that won the Stanley Cup in 1979. Uh, when he, in his first year on, in the role, he won. He was the uh, general manager for, there from '78 to '83. He passed away at the age of 92. Um, and ni- the 1983 World Series champion, Baltimore Orioles manager, was actually uh, was um, uh, Joe Altabelli passed away. Oh, uh, at the age of 88. Um, so he. Uh, they didn't say how he passed away. He's a member of the Rochester Red Wings Hall of Fame, but he'd been in a rehab facility for quite a while, so oh, okay. you can imagine it was passed away of old age. But he was the, he was the uh, played with the Indians and Twins as manager of the Giants, uh, Orioles, and Cubs, and won the World Series his first year as the manager of the Orioles. Where he took over for Earl Weaver. 
Um, yeah, I remember that. Uh, they, they beat Phil, uh, Philadelphia, I think. It was, it was 83, yep. yeah. Yeah, back in 83. Uh, and then three, a lot, three last ones here. Uh, Bob James passed away. The original lead singer of Montrose. Uh, and the guy who wrote most of their songs for their first couple of albums, um, he died at his home in, in Vegas at the age of 68. He also was with Magnet and Swan and a few other of those bands in the late 70s, early 80s, and then just disappeared for like 30 years. And then came out with, uh, came out with his own music again in the early 2010s. Uh, but yeah, he passed away at 68 of unknown causes. Uh, then Irv Cross, we should definitely talk about for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I guess the second of the year from the NFL Today uh, pregame show. That mm-hmm. I' not sure if I'm right on this, but I, as a kid anyway, I remember that being by far and away like the top pregame show. Yes, agreed. So, yeah, so it was him. Uh, Phyllis Georgia just passed away. Jimmy the Greek, who's long since gone, and Brent Musburger, who's still with us. I think he still uh, does commentary occasionally in college football. Yeah, how old is Brent Musburger at this point? I'm going to go look that up. I, I, I wouldn't have pegged him as the last survivor, though. That's for damn sure. Not that... No, not that Musburger's you're sort of, 81. 81, okay. Not that you're really thinking about that when you're watching people. Huh, I wonder who's going to be the last one to die. Eh, <laughs> I, but yeah, Ir- Irv Cross was... I just remember him as sort of this, he just had so much poise. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back then, you, well, I think it's, it was a little more different than they were trying to do a little bit more entertainment value because Irv was the only ex-jock on that crew. Right. Which is very different from what you sort of see now where – it's a lot of ex-jocks. Well, they're pretty much all ex-jocks except for like go oh, one lead. But then even when you look at them, that, usually that person's like, huh, like that, they're the size of some of those guys. Like uh, if, if, yeah. if you were to think that James Brown might have played football, I, I'd have believed it. I'm pretty sure he mm-hmm. had Agreed. Yeah. Uh, so it was really the first to try to mix the whole entertainment and everything to that. Irv was – in many ways, he was sort of, he wasn't, to me, I didn't see him as the token black guy. I saw him as sort of the straight guy, this, like the straight man who just brought uh, respectability and knowledge as, uh, from a player's point of view. That's how I remember it. Uh, obviously, the, yeah, the, the, I mean, you needed someone like that with a show that had Jimmy the Greek on it. <laughs> well, that's, that's very true. And, you know, let's also be honest with Phyllis George on it, because she wasn't exactly someone who was bringing instant credibility. She had to prove herself. Good. I don't know who was harder yeah, for. I mean, probably yeah, her. They both, they, they both had to prove themselves at the same time as Trailblazers on the same show. No, exactly. Exactly. And I, I think, who do you think would have been harder for? Phyllis or Irv? Like, who had the biggest weight on their shoulders? No, I don't know. That's hard to tell. I mean, it's really the first, he was the first African-American sports analyst on a major network TV. And then he and Phyllis George with Musburger were the first African-American and first female co-anchors on a major sports show. Right. So I, it, was, it was like both of them at the same time for very different reasons. I can't imagine the mail that those guys must have gotten on that show. <laughs> I, I would think just – and again, I, I don't know the answer to this question. I would think Irv had the biggest weight on his shoulders, but Phyllis had the most to prove. That may be true because at least Irv is coming in from the idea that we saw him play football so he knows what he's talking about. Right. And Phyllis was Miss America. Like that's not exactly yeah. a launching point to go to, – to tell – to give her opinion on, opinion on like who's going to win between the Cowboys and the Raiders. That's – not how people think then or even think now yeah. for that matter or even think now yeah yeah you still see a lot of a lot of issues with uh women who are involved. like the number of people who hate doris burke on twitter is insane to me oh i didn't know that she got but, a lot of hate on twitter oh uh, she it's like every time someone says something nice about her you again never read the comments on, under on twitter mm. but just, there's so many people who just like go after how terrible she is and she and like 
She's really good. Doris, oh, oh. Doris is great. She, like Dor- Doris, knows, she she knows her stuff. She knows exactly what she's talking about. And I know that you and I we've talked about sort of uh, uh, women in and sports journalism or as commentators before. And we both were very uh, impressed with, with with Doris. I think that was the I remember the first time I heard her because that might have been the first person I ever saw or I ever saw sorry ever heard do commentary. And I remember being taken aback for an hour and then never again because she was just knew what she was doing. Yeah. One thing I never got yeah. over, ever, 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 is when they had the World League of Football and it was a, and I don't know who the announcer was, and he was British. That just didn't mm. work. It's now first and ten, first and ten. Oh, he's going to go. He's going to stuff it up the gut now. <laughs> it didn't work. Or it's like, or it's like if I hear even an American do soccer, doesn't work for me. Yeah. Although Rob Stone is pretty good uh, as, as a play-by-play guy. But no, I agree. It's better, it's better actually with the Mexican announcers. So I, I, I prefer watching, if I can, I prefer watching soccer. Uh, in it, Like if it's the U.S. national team, I will watch it on Univision to hear the, uh, the, Hispan- the, the Mexican play-by-play guys. Well, just so. they're more excited. Goal! Yeah, but again, that's Ricardo Shaley says. They Everyone else needs to come up with their own thing. Don't just jump on his bandwagon. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, get, 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 get your own thing. There are other ways to do it. You just go, 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 like a bunch of times. That's still different. You get the same idea part. So, uh, yeah, you leave, get, get off of get off Ricardo Shaley's thing. It's like people are like, let's get ready to rumble. Like, come on, that, that's Michael Buffer. Walk away. Mm-hmm. Come up with your own thing. So, uh, anyway. does, it, does it say yeah, how Irv passed? Irv Cross. Did, did it say how he passed? Uh, he passed away of uh, cardiac disease. Mm. So, ischemic cardio- cardiomyopathy. Okay. Which I only know how to say very easily because it's one of the questions we specifically ask when you apply for life insurance. <laughs> so. <laughs> Because ischemic is not one of those words that looks like it should roll off your tongue. So, but uh, yeah. Anyway, he was eighty-one. Uh, George, by the way, was uh, seventy-one when she passed. She was ten years younger than both Cross and Musburger. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then speaking of the last of their kind, uh, when it comes to the rock hall, like almost every band. I know some of the like early doo-wop bands are all gone, but of like the. You know, 60, 70 bands, pretty much all of them got at least one member or more is the left, except for the Ramones. And now, unfortunately, we can add a second group to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bunny Whaler passed away, the last of the last of the Whalers of Bob Marley and the Whalers. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting when you're in a group with Bob Marley and Peter Tosh, and you still had a great career. Can imagine, though, you're the th- third guy. Because history kind of looks at him as the third guy, and I, I, I try not to, but it's hard. It's so hard. It is hard. Yeah. Because when the, I mean, the, the, the other two guys are in the hall, with mm-hmm. the rock hall, so he automatically becomes the third guy. Oh no, I'm sorry, Jimmy Cliff, not Peter Tosh. Yeah. My bad, my bad, my bad. Sorry, Peter Tosh. If someone should be in, Jimmy Cliff was the second. I screwed that up in my head. Yeah. Continue. So and so, yeah, he was really the the harmony of the group. It just. Right there where it began, reggae didn't begin with those three, but it came, it left Jamaica with those three. Mm-hmm. And it's just, and it's such, he has such a great discography. I, I had I was listening to a lot of it this week and just made me wonder why wasn't I listening to more of this before? And that's something I've, and I try not to because I've been listening to as much as I can, but it's always sad. Someone dies and it's like you're rediscovering all these these great things about about them. Uh, it, it's a it's a tough it's a big loss. It's a really big loss, and I, I don't I, I want to sort of take a minor shit on BBC on their news report form. So uh, where their cover was Bunny Whaler, who found fame with Bob Marley. Like just fuck off. Yeah, you know you, he you don't need to do that. In the in the in the headline, it's just not necessary, and it's yeah, and yeah, technically that's true. But come on, give the man some respect. 
As the kids say, put respect on that name. Is that how they say it? I don't, I don't know how they say it. Uh, I, I, think, I think you have to watch like the Red Thread commercial like 15 times in a row before you can say it correctly. I will, I, I will so. never... I will never get that right. I, like, I'm, I, like, I'm a geeky old white dude, so, you know, so be it. <laughs> so, and things I never thought I'd talk about again. And uh, we ended up model the UN when I was in middle school. And I had to represent Jamaica. So as a white kid from a white suburb, I tried talking with the Jamaican accent when we gave the speeches. And... Which, in retrospect, is a very cringy thing to do, but I was in middle school and I didn't know any better. Um, but the only way I could get myself to get in the accent was to sing the um, front part of the Jamaican Christmas carol, uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, that's the only like Jamaican version of, or reggae version of a Christmas carol that got played on the radio station. I had to say that over and over, like the first part. I like Every time I was about to make a, a line in speech, I did the first line of that and then said what I was supposed to say and then said it again and did the first thing I was supposed to say in order to uh, try and keep the Jamaican accent through, throughout. So, Well, I mean, keep in mind, not, though, in Canada, that can get you elected as prime minister. Well, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't as committed to the bit as your prime minister. So, Oh, God damn it. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to do my Justin Trudeau rant, rant now because I think people have sort Go of heard it. this who – We've been listening, like, clearly you hear that I, I don't like Trudeau, and there's a lot of Americans who love him. All right, I hate this fucking guy, and let me tell you why. <laughs> this, this, I, as you know, Evan, and as I've said on the show, I hate hypocrisy, and there's not a bigger hypocrite than Trudeau. And I know some people are saying, hey, that's all politicians. Okay. Let's just go with this whole blackface scandal. So, you know, there was the three pictures that came out. You saw two, or did you see the third? I, I, it's been a while, but yeah, I know, I know that came out. So. Okay. So the first one that came out was him in, I don't know, actually, I, I, I might be wrong on what was first, what was second, but he was doing, he, he, he painted himself black to be Harry Belafonte and saying Deo at his school. All right. That's, mm, okay. Then when he was 30, then it was, he, well, he painted himself black again to do an Arabian Nights thing. That was pretty stupid. But then when he was 20, that was the third thing that came up. It was just like this one second little blurb of him painted all in black. He was just wearing a t-shirt. He wasn't, wasn't even doing a costume. And when they asked him where, what he was doing, he says, oh, I, think, I think I was going on a canoe trip. Okay. What are you fucking doing on this canoe trip that you thought, you know what, I'm going to paint my entire body. Because you can see he did his whole body because he had ripped jeans and his knees were black too. Mm. Yeah. What are the jokes you're that, telling, Justin? What yeah, are you doing so that, on that, this trip? That is committing to a bit, uh, a, a lot too much. So it, it just to make a bunch of racist jokes because that's what, what else could it be? Why yeah, else do you do that? No, there's no other reason. It, it's one thing if you're a teenager and don't necessarily know better. I know the internet exists now, so it might be a little bit harder for people to understand. But if you're trying to connect with someone or whatever. But once you get out in the world, there's you should you should definitely know better. Well, here's the other thing that he's also the son of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, right? The prime minister who coined the word in Canada of multiculturalism. So you think if any late forty something Canadian would have it would know better? It's Justin fucking Trudeau. That's half a why. I, I, I just lots. Well, that's that's, that, that, that's true. That is very true. So. He should have definitely known better. Uh, whatever. Also, too. Oh well, he's the great environmentalist. Well, okay. The pipeline didn't. The, that pipeline didn't stop. That one that you, that uh, Biden canceled immediately. Uh-huh. That stopped because of Biden. It didn't stop because of Trudeau. Like so, Justin. If you're going to take pictures of you and Greta Thunberg, you know, maybe you don't sort of like keep the pipeline going. And I don't even know whether I'm pro, I'm not, I'm not environmentally knowledgeable, so I'm not going to go one way or the other. Uh, Cause I honestly don't know enough about this topic, 
I do know that it's a hypocrite, hypocritical thing for you to be pro-pipeline, but say you're anti-pipeline, you're pro-environment, but you do that sort of stuff anyway. It's sort of like saying, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm pro-choice, but you're doing your speech while holding a coat hanger in your hand. Uh-huh. It, it, and it's just time after time after time of him just doing something so colossally hypocritical. He's a He's also a guy who didn't want to even be prime minister until they sort of begged him to do it, the Liberal Party. I know people uh-huh. who knew Justin when he was a substitute teacher, smoking pot and ski and, and snowboarding. The guy's a moron. All right. He's cute. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. He, he is a very attractive person. And to that point, for those saying, well, you wish you looked like Justin. Yeah, I do. You got me. <laughs> I do wish that. Uh, sorry, breaking, breaking. unfortunately, someone passed away news. Uh, Zach Nielsen, Harry Nielsen's son, passed away with his battle of cancer. Mm. Well, uh, that was one of those people who's been sick for a while. And Alice Cooper came by at one point and everything, but he passed away. They just announced, or I just saw on Twitter. So, anyway. Changing the subject. Although I guess I could go back to, to my non-sportsman of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I like this as, as, a, as a new segment. I, re- I really yeah. like this. So my non-sportsman of the week is an easy one. It's uh, Kellen Winslow II. <laughs> uh, I, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison for multiple rapes and other sexual offenses. Um, he exposed himself to a 77-year-old neighbor. He uh, raped a hitchhiker, a 54-year-old hitchhiker, raped an unconscious 97-year-old high school senior. Like, it's just, just like all of these things just adding up. And the people are like, well, maybe he got hit in the head a lot and, and football and everything, and that's entirely possible. But, my God, he is... He, he, the greed, he essentially, uh, he essentially agreed to a reduced sentence from 18 years to 14 years. They got the maximum. His wife, uh, filed for divorce when he was, uh, when he was, uh, charged with, uh, with all this stuff. But my Lord, that man, I mean, his father, one of the greatest tight ends and one of the classiest people in NFL history. Just I don't I don't even know what to do. I mean he Yeah, he it just I don't I don't even know what to I don't even know what to do with it. It's just absolutely ridiculous. All the things that he was going that he did and everything else and just good riddance to bad rubbish. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hate it, saying that. It, it's uh, <sighs> It's, you know, the, the people who are convicted of rape, it's, it's I, I don't know why I find this sort of fascinating, but you would think that they would all have a certain look to them, this sketchy, seedy look, and some do, mm-hmm. but holy crap, it, it, it's from people of all walks of life, all ethnicities, all age groups, all nations, I, I, putting it bluntly, I don't understand what gets anyone aroused by a woman being in terror or anyone being in terror. Cause I guess, you know, it doesn't have to be a woman, of course, but right. How, well, whatever. I mean, like there's, there again, uh, there's enough shows on that, but that's just something I never, I never will. I never will understand. Don't want to understand. Don't want to talk to any sociologists about this. Just, uh, have rotten jail, asshole. Yep, and that's why he's my non-sportsman of the week. I don't really want to talk about it anymore. Uh, but just before before we go, I want to make sure we do talk about a much better human being, as by all accounts, mm-hmm. who went out and signed a one-day contract yes. today with the Carolina Panthers and retired. Uh, Thomas Davis. Yeah, we almost forgot about him. Yeah, uh, re- just r- real good guy. I always li- love it when... They, when athletes sign those one-day contracts just to 
really close out a career. It's not just great for them. It's great for the fans, too. Uh, it's a win-win for everybody. I don't see him ever getting into uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, Panthers Ring of Honor may not even be a lock, either. I mean, he played with them, though, from 2005 to 2018. Mm-hmm. Three-time Pro Bowler, first-team All-Pro in 15, uh, second-team All-Pro in 2013. He's the Walter Payton Man of the Year. That's true. Like, like he's – Thomas Davis is definitely a Panthers Hall of Famer. I mean, it's not like the Panthers have this incredibly crazy long history. I don't know if Jake Delhomme is a Panthers – Hall of Famer, but I'm probably sure he is. And if he is, then Tom Thomas Davis should be. Thomas Davis is definitely should be a Hall of Famer for the for the Panthers. As for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, no. At, yeah, it, it's a lot harder. So I'm going to print Pro Football Reference page. I had it up and I accidentally closed it earlier. Um. So he is, according to. Hold on a second. According to this, he is, why can't I find what I'm looking for? 53rd among outside linebackers. So for for football monitor, he's 53rd, which puts him, I I was hoping he was going to be ahead of Clay Matthews, but he's not. (laughs) Um, Oh, Clay. um, What's this? Not one. Thomas, Jones, why can't I find you? Oh, it's because Thomas Davis, an idiot. Come on, Davis. Uh, Thomas Davis, why can't I find him? It said that he was 53rd among outside linebackers. He's not even there when I go there. Um, 43.60. Uh, fo- uh, football, those reference pages, they just have so much data coming in all the time. Yeah, I, I don't have, I can't find them on here, but if it, if that is correct with 43.60, mm-hmm. that puts them around Takeo Spikes territory. Which um, is so not... Takeo Spikes, yeah. Larry Morris, Mike Vrabel, um, folks, uh, Willie McGinnis, Seth Joyner, very, very good players, although I, I'm very partial to Willie McGinnis. But very, very good players who are probably not Hall of Famers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's no no player with that rating. The lowest rated outside linebacker in the Hall of Fame is Dave Wilcox, uh, and he's at 50.78. He played old. He retired in 1974 when the standards were different. Right. Uh, and, they didn't, and they didn't keep track of sacks, which would probably help his career quite a bit. Um, so I don't see him as a Hall of Famer. Uh, but a very, very good player. Definitely should be in the Panthers' ring of honor. Um, and uh, congratulations on uh, a stellar career, a very good career. So, no, absolutely, absolutely. I was going to uh, do. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, what were you going to say? I, I, I was going to sort of like look up cameos because I said oh, last. Yeah. I said but, last week. Yeah, but, but, before we get to that, though, I just want to bring up one other thing, and then you go to your cameos. Mm. Did you read the Ron, the Ron Borges article about how there have been too many first battle Hall of Famers recently? I refuse to read it. Yeah, Ron Borges, as we said before, is one of my – Yeah, he's a Patriot supporter who really hates football, like a lot. Um, and he has a whole thing about how next year no one should – none of the people should be getting in – Hall of Fame, like he basically says, if you're a first ballot Hall of Famer, it should just be, when someone stands up to talk about it, you should just be your name, and that's it. Just sit down. Jim Brown and sit down, is what he said. And he said that Charles Woodson, he put up Charles Woodson as someone who is not, should not have been a first ballot Hall of Famer, which is well, silly. Well, it's idiotic if, if uh, when Woodson was clearly the t- one of the top five people in that group. And uh, he's referencing... DeMarcus Ware. And, okay, okay, so actually let's go here. Uh, I've completed the pro football revisions. Uh And, you know, that's where we rank those who are now now eligible for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. First you take out the people who just got in, and then you, you upload the people who are eligible now. 
DeMarcus is number one. He's taking over the number one spot. Why yeah. shouldn't he be a first ballot Hall of Famer? And if not, who are the five people, Ron, that you're going to put ahead of him? Just because his, his, he, just because his name doesn't roll off the tongue? And it doesn't well, make I mean, you think I think, automatically? I, I, think the answer, I think the answer to that is Tony Vicelli, Richard Seymour, uh, Leroy Butler, Zach Thomas, and either Tory Holt or Reggie Wayne. I think he sees all five of those guys as better than DeMarcus Ware. He brings up the fact that it took Kevin Green 12 years to get in in his fifth year in the ballot, and he retired uh, third in the sacks, and now 22 years after retired is still third in sacks. Like, and it brought up the fact that um, other people who have, although I do think it's funny that did anyone argue at length for John Elway? Because at this point, many people think that John Elway is one of the most overrated quarterbacks in the hall. Uh, but he brings up the fact that where's ninth all time with 138 and a half sacks. And that Mathis is 19th with 123. He's like, but that doesn't matter because Lucy O'Neill who has fewer sacks than Marcus Ware. Uh, has never been a finalist. And Simeon Rice uh, has never come close to being a finalist. Lil T, which we know is not true because he's been in semifinals before with 122. So he just kind of cherry picks things that he likes and ignores the rest. He's like, Simeon Rice has never been close to being a finalist. He's a semifinalist. That automatically makes him close. <laughs> yeah, literally one level away. Yeah. So, and again, Leslie O'Neill, if you like Leslie O'Neill that much, then maybe you should push for him because I think there's an argument to be made for Leslie O'Neill's at least being looked at, particularly with the sure. class coming out. Absolutely. Um, and so I just don't, I just don't think, feel like mistakes made in the past are reasons. Like he brings up, well, we can't vote in Devin Hester because Billy White Street Johnson, isn't it? Okay. I'm glad and I didn't you're, read this. You're on the seniors committee. Put Billy White Street Johnson. Like you're literally, he's been on that committee for 10 years. Just put like you didn't even nominate him even though he's on the 75th anniversary team, he wasn't one of the people, 20 people got nominated for the, for the uh, 100th anniversary team. He's on the 50th and 75th anniversary teams and then still they get nominated with 20 new spots. Like, what, what, your, don't talk about this. Like, you have no part in it. So, I don't think Devin Hester's going to get, I think it's going to be hard for Devin Hester to get in. Very um, hard. He brings up Brian Mitchell as like, being ahead of him in every category except for except for kick returns for touchdown. Um, he's way ahead in return yards. He's way ahead in all-purpose yards. Uh, much better threat outside the kick game as well. I right, then get Brian Mitchell on the ballot. Like, it's, it's, it's just a silly, it's a silly argument to be like, well, this guy can't be in because this other guy's not in because we've never considered this other guy. Okay, then figure out a way to get that guy considered. Like, you're part of this whole process, dude. You're an integral part. He's been a voter for 20 years and 10 years on the seniors committee. Like, stop being a bratty old man and do something about it. It's just, Rob Borges and, and Dan Shaughnessy are both work for the same newspaper and are two people who hate sports more than possibly anyone else in the industry. It's it's crazy. It's 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 just absolutely nuts to me that Ron Borges is allowed anywhere near the Hall of Fame for how much he hates the sport. So anyway, yeah. I just wanted to bring that up. Quickly. You know, maybe we should put together a group of people who really like sports and really like Halls of Fame and really enjoy this. Maybe we, you and I should do that, huh? We could talk about that in a couple of weeks. It'd never work. <laughs> Ah uh, yes, I, that's going to be fun when we launch that in a couple of weeks. But we'll yep. we'll save that for then. So yep. before we go, I wanted to. I, I said last week at the end of last week, I wanted to sort of like goof off through cameo and just look at Hall of Fame mm-hmm. related people. And my God, that sucked. It did. It did. These people are boring the hell out. Of, first off, why would anyone buy a cameo for? Uh, on this just so that somebody who you'll never meet in your life can just give you a two minute personalized video 
which isn't all that personal. You think they remember you? No. It's, I watched some of the worst shit ever, just hoping that maybe I could come up with something that might be funny and we could rip on it. And I did. I found a few interesting things. But here's my funniest thing ever, and it wasn't actually watching the, watching the, the cameo of, of this gentleman, because I, I didn't do it. But maybe I should. Uh, so Brett Favre is on, and it's not about Brett. Brett Favre is on cameo, and he charges four hundred dollars. You know what other Boston sports legend charges four hundred dollars? Take a guess. What Boston sports legend charges four hundred dollars yes. for a cameo? Yeah. When you're thinking of great, yeah, who is in the same breath? as Brett Favre and can charge the same amount. Are you being sarcastic or not? Oh, I'm being very sarcastic. Okay. Uh, Boston sports legend. Still playing. Charged, uh, what? Still playing? Yes. Uh, Julian Edelman. Go further down the trough. Uh, I was trying to come up with someone who's not quite as good as is it the same sport? No. Okay. Then we're going to go to... Uh, oh, man, I don't even know. Uh, uh, Marcus Smart. I have no idea. Taco Fall. Ah. I don't even think he's on your main roster right now. He is. He he, uh, he played a few games. I actually, again, I have spreadsheets. Ready? Uh, so, so I updated the Celtics points leaders this evening after they beat Toronto. I mean the Tampa Raptors. <laughs> uh, Taco Fall is 364th on the Celtics all-time scoring list uh, with 44 career points. So... Yeah, and yeah. he's worth as just as much as Brett Favre. In the words of the late great Roman thinker Publius Sirius, "Everything is worth what his purchaser will pay for it." That that is very true. So I found your ear. I'll, I'll, I want to close off with this cameo, and if we like it. We can sort of like move on. So for $75, you can get a former heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. Oh, wow. And here's him. It says, here's a pep talk from Larry Holmes. All right, go for it. All right. Hey, Pop. Larry Holmes, former heavyweight boxing champion of the world. What kept me going was my attitude. I had a strong attitude. I didn't let things get me down. Little things like now, you might say, get you down because the weather is bad. You can't do nothing. You can't go out and walk like you want to walk. So, you know, you just hang on in there, man. And think of Larry Holmes. And riding your bike. And, and if you can't jump some rope. And one thing about it, you know, when everybody else is bad attitude, you smile and laugh at them because they don't know how good they got it. This comes from your son, John. Mm -hmm. If you don't straighten out, I'm coming and knock you out. (laughs) Yeah, and see, I uh, I don't know if you heard in between his pregnant pauses, was someone telling him what to say and mm. sort of whispering that to him? Is that $75 worth of entertainment for you? Probably not. Yeah. So, Larry Holmes, everybody. Mm. You know what? I'm going to edit that shit out. That was boring as fuck. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough, my friend. Yeah. This. Um, 
All right, so do we, do we have anything else we want to cover for right now? No. Uh, so next week, Evan, we know what we've got. Uh, we're pretty sure that the Basketball Hall of Fame will announce their finalists. You've given me an over and under of two and a half, whether I would not know some of these finalists. Which is Are you taking the over or the under? I'll take the over because there's going to be some yeah. categories that I just won't know – who they are. I suppose if it's someone who was nominated before, that really won't count. But if it's just names I've heard of, but I really couldn't pick them out of a police lineup, then I guess it doesn't count. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll I, I'll, I'll say over. I, I, I'm guessing it's going to be way over. Well, it depends. I mean, we don't even know how many fi- finalists they're going to do because that's the other thing. They're not consistent at all, which is why – for a sport so big internationally and especially in the United States, their Hall of Fame is, I don't want to say worthless because it's not, but my God, it's so not what it should be. Mm-hmm. And with that, <laughs> the bar is closed. Well, I'm still drinking my uh, my bourbon as we speak, so ah. it's not close for me yet. All right. Well, Elvis has left the building. Something. Give. Me, l- let me run with one of these <laughs> bad analogies. <laughs> Larry Holmes has left the cameo. La- Larry Holmes has left the cameo. Now, well, okay. Now, I, now I can't edit all that shit out. <laughs> all right. So there you go. My fail of cameo has just now been up. Will now remain. For your entertainment. Yes, sometimes <laughs> Buckner doesn't get them right. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes I think I've got a great idea and I got shit. There was shit. Hey, what, what you got to do? You got to try stuff out, man. You just, you don't know until, until you, uh, I, I thought that, you don't sh- know until, until you try. I thought that shit was actually going to stick to the wall a little bit, but no, it fell completely off and left a, it didn't even like leave a stain on the wall. It's now on my floor and I got to clean it up. Fair enough. So do, do we need to go back to, like, Esperanto? Should I go into, like, another Pope's history? What, what do we need to do to close this out? Uh, <laughs> just say goodnight, Gracie. <laughs> goodnight, George. All right. Have a good one. Stay safe, everybody. All right, take care, man. Bye. 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 Bye.